So without further ado, uh, I'm hoping many of you already know Howie. Um, let me bring Howie up. Well, good evening. Hey, Mitch, how are you? Great, great. So uh, you do an awful lot of traveling because every time I, I email you or talk to you, you're in a different location and you're in a hotel room now. So uh, maybe oh, yeah. just tell people a little bit of, uh, where you are and what you're doing right now. Okay. Well, um, today and tomorrow, I'm actually in uh, Mississippi, uh, about an hour, uh, about, about 10 minutes south of uh, of uh, Memphis, and I'm working with the um, DeSoto School District, DeSoto County School District, and I'm consulting in their school for emotionally disturbed and behaviorally disordered kids. But um, I, you know, I, I worked for the Arkansas Department of Education for 13 years and finished about a year ago. But even when I was working for the department, um, they allowed me to do my national consulting. So I'm on the road 150, 200 days a year, and I work anywhere from, um, you know, anywhere in the country. Um, you know, from Florida to California. I was up in Alaska in August, and I do international work. In fact, I was in Jamaica just a week ago and did a uh, major address for their special education annual conference. So um, I do a lot of work uh, consulting in schools and districts and um, obviously uh, enjoy the travel. And I just caught this. You said Alaska in August. And that wasn't February, right? <laughs> no, but I, uh, I actually, I've done it in February before. So <laughs> that's, yeah. that's got to be cold and dark. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah. All right. Well, let me bring my yeah. I'll let me bring myself down, and I'll bring your slides up, and let's get started. Okay. All right, so there are the slides. Tonight, folks, we're, we're going to talk about multi-tiered services. Um, we're going to put it into the context of, again, school discipline, classroom management, and student self-management, um, and really focus on, obviously, our, our children and adolescents relative to kids with social, emotional, and behavioral needs. So next slide. Go ahead. Next slide. Next one, Mitch. Go ahead. All right, so here's the context um, for our discussion. Um, and the context, I want to really connect this with the new Elementary and Secondary Education Act. And ESSA, um, which is the other term for it, which is the Every Student Succeeds Act, it does require districts and schools to develop multi-tiered systems of services, support, strategies, programs, and interventions for kids who are at risk, underachieving, unresponsive, and unsuccessful. And again, there is that requirement. Most of the wording in uh, this slide is my wording. And so what we've got to do from a state perspective down to a district, down to a school level, is we've got to create a defensible assessment process that determines the underlying reasons why students are having either academic or social emotional behavioral difficulties and then connect those underlying reasons with instructional or intervention strategies services supports and and so on so that we're helping to alleviate some of those problems and facilitate those students um, effective learning next slide and so the goals for um, today's kind of presentation slash discussion is very quickly I want to talk about the areas of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act that directly relate to student discipline, um, academic engagement, and multi-tiered services. We're going to talk about a multi-tiered decision-making process that basically is common sense and hopefully will be embraced um, by those of you that are uh, on this presentation and on this webinar. And then I want to introduce a what I'm going to call a 21st century functional assessment approach to identify the underlying reasons why students present with social, emotional, and behavioral issues. And then we can open it up and have some discussions. So go ahead and next slide. 
and actually we will have three opportunities over the course of the next um, 50 minutes to have discussions. The first discussion is going to be short, the next one a little bit longer, and the last one will um, really open it up for um, both discussion in small groups and questions and answers. So Drayton said, change starts when someone sees the next step. And, and the unfortunate reality is that sometimes what happens in our schools is we don't have a blueprint or we don't have an evidence-based blueprint. And we're kind of making it up as we go along. And unfortunately, uh, for the past number of years, in some areas of practice, like school improvement, or positive behavioral supports, or even multi-tiered services, um, the federal government, the US Department of Education, has been actually making it up to some degree and experimenting on us. So rather than field testing different approaches, um, they basically said, all right, this is what we think is going to work. Go ahead and do it. Next slide. The good news is that we have a reauthorized Elementary and Secondary Education Act, and it really gives us an opportunity to look at what are we doing right now, what do we need to be doing, and how are we going to get there. Uh, but again, today, last session, our next session in a couple of weeks, we're going to focus on the social, emotional, and behavioral needs of students. All right, so go ahead, next slide. So in that context of social emotional behavioral. Let's just make a couple of points about what the Elementary and Secondary Education Act has in it. First of all, states are required by ESSA to basically create a lot of the processes that we need for effective education, effective teaching, effective progress monitoring, and so on and so forth. So in other words, one of the major changes in the law is that the top-down approach from the Federal Department of Education down has been basically shifted and a lot of the responsibility for self-determination is at the State Department of Education level with the input of the schools and the districts. Now obviously the plans at the state level need to be approved by the federal level but the feds are no longer going to be able to say you've got to do this, that or the other thing. So for example, um, the four areas of school improvement for schools in improvement status that the federal government came up with, those are gone. Those are not ones that need to be utilized. In fact, the districts uh, with uh, you know, the collaboration at the state level are going to decide how are we going to do school improvement. Next slide. So now drilling this down and focusing on again the social, emotional, and behavioral. Schools and districts must, according to the law, they must describe how they're going to improve how they're going to improve school conditions for student learning. And, and in addition to that, not just the positive conditions for learning, but also how the schools and the districts supported by the state are going to reduce harassment and bullying, uh, reduce the overuse of discipline that removes students from the classroom, and um, increase uh, the use of appropriate behavioral interventions um, that facilitate students' health and safety. Next slide. So there needs to be, again, this plan. The, the states and the district have to dis decide how they're going to do it, and they need to basically codify this in a plan. Another provision related. Every year, the state the school districts and the schools have to publish a report card, which we've been doing um, under No Child Left Behind, but doing it more from an academic perspective. But now included in that report card need to be on an annual basis the rates of in-school suspension, out-of-school suspension, expulsions, school-related arrests, referrals to, of students to law enforcement, chronic absenteeism, and incidents of violence that include bullying and harassment. So the districts and the schools are going to have to, again, produce an annual report with a count in these different areas. Next slide. Relative to RTI, PBIS, and MTSS, and I want you to notice at the top of this slide, these are, I did this on, on purpose, I wrote these in lowercase terms. You're going to understand this in one second. First of all, the Elementary and Secondary Education Reauthorized Act, again, it was reauthorized this past December. The vast majority of it will be implemented in July coming. The new law does not mention at all response to intervention. 
the new law mentions positive behavioral interventions and supports three times. It mentions multi-tiered systems of supports five times. Here's a critical point. In the law, these terms, positive behavioral interventions and supports and multi-tiered systems of support are always in the lower case with no acronyms. And so it is referring to generic implementation in these areas. And so being much more explicit, the new law does not require the use of the Federal Department of Education's capital positive behavioral intervention support or multi-tiered service uh, and uh, system of services frameworks. Okay, what has happened though over the past decade or more is that the Department of Education has made it appear they have confused the upper and the lower case and made it appear that you've got to use their national approach, their national TA centers, and so on. That is not the case. And so in essence, the districts and schools supported by the state, you need to influence your State Department of Education as they're in their planning processes right now for positive behavioral interventions and supports and multi-tiered systems of support. You need to influence, have some input into what your state system should be. It does not have to be the federal system and quite honestly relative to RTI uppercase and uppercase positive behavioral interventions and supports we have a number of national studies that have demonstrated within the past two years that those frameworks do not work. They do not produce academic and behavioral outcomes the way they are intended for kids. And so next slide. Multi-tiered services is defined in the law. By the way, positive behavioral interventions and supports is never defined. It has never been defined, nor is it defined in the new Elementary and Secondary Education Act. So it's simply there as a generic without definition. But the new ESEA does define multi-tiered services, and you've got the definition in front of you. It is a comprehensive continuum of evidence-based systemic practices to support a rapid response to students' needs with regular observation to facilitate data-based instructional decision-making. And I would suggest that the multi-tiered services are not just for the academic, but also for the social, emotional, and behavioral. As I said, the term appears, multi-tiered support, only five times in the law. Two times are in the definition that I just read, or the section of the law that defines the term. Next slide. The other three areas where it talks about multi-tiered services, one of them is right here, okay, that basically funds need to be used to develop programs and activities that increase the ability of teachers to effectively teach students with disabilities, including students with significant cognitive disabilities, and English language learners, which include, as you see, the multi-tiered services of support and the positive behavioral interventions and support. So again, in this fourth area, of the five where the term is appearing in the law, it's talking about the need for the district, the school, and then the teachers to effectively uh, be able to teach kids with disabilities, cognitive disabilities, and English language learners so that they can meet, as you can see at the end of the definition, challenging state academic standards. Next slide. The other areas where um, multi-tiered services appear is in the following areas in terms of looking at students, again, with disabilities, looking at students with developmental delays, looking at students that need services and supports from an academic and a behavioral perspective in order to be able to academically and behaviorally succeed in the classroom. So next slide. So very quickly, I gave you the legal context and some of the areas where uh, the multi-tiered services of support term appears in the law. So let's open it up for a short discussion right now. So right now, what is your district and school doing, hopefully in collaboration with your departments of education, to prepare in the multi-tiered services area, which I would suggest looking at what are you doing right now, how are the data looking in terms of the efficacy and the outcomes for students? Where are the gaps and what do you need to do to fill the gaps? So let's go ahead and open up the discussion.
Okay, so this is this is where you interact. Remember, there's two different ways of interacting here. Uh, the first is that if you have a webcam and a microphone, you can click on the avatar of another person who has a webcam and a microphone, and you can have a dis uh, just a video discussion with them, which is a lot of fun. So I'd encourage you to do that if you can. And then the second way of interacting is uh, opening up the IM window if you don't have it opened up. And you open it up by moving your cursor over your avatar. You'll see there's five buttons, one of which is IM. You can open up the IM uh, dialog box and uh, type in answers to this question. So what what is your district and in schools doing right now to prepare in these areas for um, you know children with emotional and behavioral problems? I'm going to bring myself down and uh, we'll come back up in a couple minutes. So please discuss this among yourselves in either the IM box or uh, or click on the avatar of, of somebody in your room. Okay, well, I see a couple people have had a chance to, uh, or, or a few, quite a few people have had a chance to interact with each other. So let me, let me ask you, um, you know, as somebody who's been in education for a long time, I've seen, you know, so many things come and go. It's a priority this year and it's not a priority this next year. What if schools just ignore this? What if they don't come up with these plans? Well, I mean, the reality is they've got to come up with the plans. The question is, do they implement the plan? Um, I think what's going to happen is the State Departments of Education are going to create a framework. I hope that's what they're going to do. And then let the districts work within the framework and be able to tailor the actual implementation to the needs and the resources of those respective districts. But mm -hmm. we all know some states may end up basically usurping the top down from the federal government and saying to the, the districts, you're going to do it this way. But it's mm -hmm. interesting because right now we have a 50 state plus the, uh, you know, DC, um, a 51 state crapshoot. So we'll see what happens from a state to state perspective. So I'm curious to know, uh, among the people here, if somebody would want to come up and talk to you about either what they see their school doing, what they'd like to see their school doing, um, what they see their, what, what changes they'd like to see. Uh, so if you could raise your hand, if you've got a webcam and a microphone, raise your hand and uh, maybe you can come up and talk with, with Howie right now. And I think that will help everybody else also. Um, and I know that you all get in front of classrooms, so I know you, you're, you're used to talking in front. And I know how difficult you find it to, to get volunteers sometimes. So um, I'm hoping one of you uh, doesn't mind and uh, clicks that raise hand button, uh, the one underneath your avatar, and that's how I can tell whether you're willing to come up. Um, but I'm not seeing any. So what we need to do now, Mitch, is you need to send that electric jolt to all of the people's computers because they're not participating. OK. All right. Um, I'll, I'll do that. Um, but in the meantime, maybe I'll, I'll pull your slides back up. All right. Let's okay? go. But, but if you get a jolt, it's because <laughs> I sent it. OK. <laughs> All right, so let's drill this down and talk about kind of what I think is a common sense approach to the multi-tiered system. All right, so what you see in the slide here is you see an intersect between academic instruction and intervention and behavioral instruction and intervention. And the reason why I do that is that if you go to virtually any classroom in the country, you will find some kids who are behaviorally acting out because of academic frustration and some kids who are academically not successful because they can't or they're not demonstrating the behaviors that they need to be academically successful. For example, sitting in the seat or working independently or engaging in a cooperative fashion in a cooperative learning group. And so automatically, there's an interdependency between the academics and the behavior. In the center, you can see kind of the response to intervention process, which is eventually that database problem solving process to figure out why a student is not being successful. The three color bands are representing in the slide, tier one, which is prevention, 
Tier two, which is strategic intervention, including services and supports, and tier three, which is intensive need or crisis management. Next slide. So what are the tiers? And again, this, for those of you in the United States, and we have people who are here internationally on this call, but here in the United States, what the Department of Education has told you of the tiers is basically unfounded. And what they've done is they've said that the tiers, um, in essence, are um, representative of percentages and representative of a certain level of service delivery. So tier one is supposed to represent 80% of the kids, and it's the services for all kids. Tier two represents up to 15% of the remaining kids, and it's, in essence, group intervention. And tier three um, is, in essence, three to five percent of the kids who are left, and that's individual intervention. And basically what they did was they took a model from the epidemiological research, community mental health, if you will, and tried to apply it to schools, and it doesn't apply. And they basically made up the percentages. All right, so a more common sense approach to the tiers. What they are is an organizational structure that reflects the intensity of services, supports, and strategies that kids need. It's a fluid system, and it basically is trying to look at the resources in the school or the district and match them with the need of the student. But the issue is this. For a well-resourced school or district, they may be able to provide some services and supports, again, intensity, at the tier two level because some of those services and supports are people who are employed by the district. If you're in a district that doesn't have a lot of resources where you have to go outside into the community or import the services, those may be considered tier three. And again, there are multiple definitions of intensity, but the issue is it is not about percentages. It is not a lockstep process. The way the federal government has defined the tiers is you are in tier one, and if you're not successful, then you go to tier two. And if you're not successful, then you go to tier three. And if you go back to the other slide that I just showed you, you can see that they're on and off ramps. And so basically, if you have a student who, let's just say, has a life crisis and they're in tier one, they're in the green zone, but they lose their parents to a horrific accident. Well, that student may need immediate, if you will, tier three services. So you don't force them to go to tier two and then fail in tier two to get to tier three. That doesn't make sense. They have an immediate need for tier three and they get those services. All right, so let's skip ahead two slides. So some of the things at tier one, and you can read this, but I mean, obviously what we're trying to do in especially the social, emotional, and behavioral areas, as well as the academic, is we want to have positive school and classroom climates, effective instructional grouping, good instruction, teaching kids at their instructional levels, all the way down to modifications, accommodations, and early intervention. So in essence, to give you a blueprint of what should occur academically, social, emotional, and behaviorally in tier one, um, in essence, it's kind of the list of things that you see on the right-hand side of the slide. Now, what happens in tier one is as a student is not successful in the classroom, the teacher begins engaging in problem solving to figure out why didn't the student get that lesson? Why didn't they master that material? And it may be that at a tier one level, the teacher figures it out on their own, and it may be that there's reteaching involved, or there may need to be modifications, or the student may need some prerequisite skills remediated. And so the teachers doing that problem solving, they're basically doing the instructional or intervention approaches through the ladder, through classroom management, and we're all good to go. Next slide. But we know that even in the most effective classroom, we've got some students who need additional or concurrent services, support strategies, and programs for either academics or in the frame of our discussions today, social, emotional, and behavioral instruction. So next slide. And so what we've got to do in terms of building the multi-tiered service delivery system is we've got to have a multi-tiered decision-making process. So we've got to have classroom teachers and grade levels that are good at figuring out why students are not succeeding at, let's just say, the tier one level. But then we may have to have 
um, additional support people, our counselors, social work, school psychologists, our special education specialists, who are able to pick up the ball and work with the classroom teachers to do the next layer or level or intensity of functional assessment to figure out again why the students having the difficulties so that we can move into some kind of either strategic or intensive intervention and so what I want to introduce you know as part of this process and I'm going to talk about it in the latter part of our, our, our time tonight are the seven high hit reasons why kids present with challenging behavior next slide but the multi-tiered process starts with an effective classroom and so we've got to recognize that we need all of our teachers providing effective, differentiated academic instruction and good classroom management. And what I'm alluding to is that sometimes we have kids that exhibit problems and they're instructional casualties. We sometimes have kids who are demonstrating problems and they're curricular casualties. So, for, for example, maybe we don't have a social skills program that are teaching all of the kids the social skills and therefore we're getting some of the behavioral issues because of the absence of the preventative program. And so we've got to recognize that it's not all about the kids, it's actually about the instructional environment. Next slide. So relative to students that are having some difficulty academically or behaviorally in the classroom and again we're talking about general education our recommendation as a, and a critical part of this process as we're getting into the database decision making is that the classroom teacher or teachers at the grade level they do the following things they do a cumulative record review they meet with the parents they meet with previous teachers they look and and talk with other specialists who may have already done some work with the student of concern in terms of history background current status and so it's really the classroom teachers that begin the problem-solving process because quite honestly they're the ones that know more about the child or adolescent than anyone else next slide so some of the things that we are suggesting and these are the things that I'm training teachers to do preschool mid, uh, elementary middle and high school this is what I do is to train teachers and buildings in how to collect and be able to sift through the data but the first things first that we've got to do as part of this whole kind of data gathering process is we need to know the current functional status of the student because if a student is behaviorally acting out because of academic frustration we're only going to find that by identifying the current status of the student on an academic level we also have to do that on a social emotional and behavioral level we've got to identify what initially we think of the problems we have to again review the records do the interviews interview other people we've got to discount the medical right from the very beginning sleep diet exercise but also biochemical physiological organic genetic issues that we don't want to kind of find out about six or twelve months into the process we want to deal with it right from the very beginning so we either discount the medical or we recognize that there are some medical or biophysiological issues that we have to weigh into the process and then we want to do some classroom observations to see if we especially on a social emotional behavioral level if there are chains of behavior that we can kind of recognize that may help us again to understand the problem in greater depth next slide and so what we're doing in this initial problem identification is identifying student strengths and weaknesses critical life events milestones and circumstances positive and negative discounting or identifying the biological looking at the students um, learning pattern and their speed of acquisition how much progress they've made for the number of years and number of months in school and then by the record review we also are able to identify issues around attendance poor instruction school or curricular moves let me give an example of poor instruction what happens if we have a student who is again behaviorally acting out because of academic problems and we find out that last year um, no disrespect here but last year um, that student had a long-term substitute and that substitute was the best the district could do but that 
substitute really wasn't top notch in terms of the academic instruction for the student and now the student is six let's say eight months behind and is now getting frustrated and what appears to be the behavioral problem is actually an academic frustration problem born of the fact that the student had a long-term substitute that didn't quite get the job done that's what you're uncovering in the record review at times next slide and so when the teacher or the grade level team or at the secondary level the instructional team is um, is going through this information then they have a decision to make they may learn enough that they can then do some classroom based um, interventions or adaptations or modifications they may say you know something I've got to bring this up to the grade level because I don't quite understand everything and I've got some really top-notch people at my grade level and maybe another perspective or their experiential level will help me to solve the problem and understand it better or it may be that the teacher identifies this is a really serious complex case and it's very significant we need to go right up to the building level what we call the sprint team which other you know schools and districts call a child study team a student assistance team um, an intervention uh, an intervention support team I mean whatever your school or district calls that team the teacher is saying look this is complex we've got the data right now I need a multidisciplinary perspective next slide some critical issues in terms of going to the building level team first of all and this is I'm saying this because the federal government and a lot of the national quote experts have created these conditions which makes no sense if a teacher or teaching team believe that a student needs to go to the multidisciplinary team there are no prerequisites what's happened the last um, five to ten years is that um, there's a prerequisite and what the teachers are told is you have to do X number of interventions for X period of time and you have to present us the data that demonstrate the, that the intervention doesn't work well what happens if the teacher doesn't know how to do anything more than they've already done do we want teachers to pull down random interventions from the internet implement them they don't work big surprise because they're the wrong interventions and that actually make the problem worse that makes no sense there's no common sense and then process and so we've got to trust our teachers that if they feel a multidisciplinary perspective needs to occur that a case can go immediately up to the building level team without prerequisite interventions the teacher presents the case study the team determines whether or not they have enough information to proceed and the goal of that building level meeting is to identify the right assessment or intervention consultant to then work with the teacher to work the problem what's happening in a lot of our schools is that the building level team feels that they need to come up with solutions well how can you come up with a solution to a complex case study in an hour two hours or even three hours when you don't even have all the necessarily necessary information and so the multi-tiered process that has existed across the country to a large degree has not worked and quite honestly is indefensible under the new ESEA we have an opportunity to change these bad practices and turn them into good next slide and so the critical point here is that ultimately the data-based problem-solving process especially when a case goes up to the building level team it is done outside of the meeting of the team done by a consultant who has been selected for the highest probability of success and it's done in the classroom or the setting where the difficulties are existing next slide and so here's the discussion the discussion is right now what is your school or district doing to provide effective multi-service multi-tiered services are they successful where are they not successful and what is the process that they are using and does the district right now need to look at its process and either fine-tune it or in essence clear the deck and come up with a more defensible process and so here's there's the discussion So just um, maybe before people talk about this, there, there was a really interesting question I thought from uh, Julia, and that is that the the annual reports that uh, districts, I, I guess districts after 
prepare. You know, how do they those affect what happens in the classroom? How does that affect the education? Is, the is there a direct effect? The district reports that are going up to the state departments. Right, right. Are there is anything done with them, or what what happens? How do they affect what happens in the classroom? I'll I'll be honest with you. I mean, to a large degree, why? They, Go ahead. they don't. Then you're running for president no. and lie. No, I'm. Not, they they don't. I mean, the mm -hmm. data that are being collected, at least under the last, you know, um, No Child Left Behind, were so focused on the state benchmark assessments and less mm -hmm. focused on implementing good curriculum and tracking kids' progress that the sensitivity to what they were evaluating didn't go down to the classroom level. And, and then actually, it, it created a lot of bad practices. What happened was um, all of a sudden we had um, districts that had scope and sequences, and then they had pacing charts, and then the pacing charts became basically mandated. So if um, a science teacher on, on, on October 20th wasn't on this chapter and these pages, then they were deemed to be not effective. And so it was a curricula-driven process rather than a student mastery process. And we know what we got. We got, basically, kids who um, are, those of them that are successful in terms of literacy, um, were only getting success at the, what, 40, 45% level. Right. We still get mm -hmm. 50 to 55% of our kids that are not reading on grade level. They're not doing math on grade level. We have big deal, an 82% graduation rate, but then we have a 45% rate of our kids that go to college who in the first year need, re need remediation. So the system hasn't worked. So, so then what we could say is that these reports that are now being required by the ESSA, whereas the reports themselves may not have a direct effect on education, the fact that these are kind of new reports, a new way of thinking about it, hopefully stimulates conversations to better link uh, what we do about behavior with kids with what we do in academics. Absolutely. That's how I would, okay. We've got right. to get down so to I'm, a functional yeah. level. Okay. So I'm going to bring myself down. I'll bring the questions back up and I'll bring you down and hopefully um, people can discuss uh, the questions among themselves. I'll, I'll bring you down now. And, um, and uh, we'll come back up. Helen and I will come back up in about three or four minutes. So I'll bring myself down and the questions up. And while you're discussing this with other people, again, remember you can click on somebody's avatar or you can do this through an IM window uh, and you get your IM window up by moving your cursor over your, your avatar and clicking on the IM button and then, and then typing in there. Um, you can also ask questions. Uh, you, you've heard me bring up a, one question that was asked. Um, feel free to ask other questions about uh, working with students and um, and different interventions or assessments we can do about the behavior and how that affects academics. So uh, ask questions. I am with each other and other, and we'll be back up in a couple of minutes. Okay. Well, welcome back up. Um, so, uh, oh, and there there seems to, there is a question here also. Um, uh, so, so somebody, uh, so Dana asked a question. Uh, she feels that, or he, I, I shouldn't say, because I know both men and women who are Dana. So it's Dana a, it's feels. A, it's a she. It's a she. Okay. All right. Um, feels uh, somewhat left to her own devices um, and the web. Can you suggest some resources for interventions not requiring special training? Oh, um, <laughs> I mean, you know, I think, you know, being an effective teacher obviously takes effective training. But let me let me suggest some resources. Um, and, and again, this is not self-serving. and These resources are free. If people go on my website, which is www.projectachieve.net, understand that Project Achieve is an evidence-based model by the Department of Health and Human Services, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. So the work that I do and have done for the past 30 years has basically been identified as evidence-based by the federal government looking at data that we have done uh, and implemented and gathered all over the country, and they have independently evaluated that data. 
if you go to the website and go to the RTI part of the website, you will see two things. The first two things that, are, and these are all basically they're all free. Okay, but you will see a um, an impl a, a multi-tiered services implementation guide that gives basically step by step um, a lot of the processes that I'm giving you tip of the iceberg to. You will also find in the website, and if people can't find it, just email me. I have 10 national webinars that are posted on the website where they can start looking at and, again, um, drilling down into some of the things that we're talking about here. So, I mean, right there is a start. And then if I can help, I guess my preference, rather than give a lot of websites, is let people email me and um, I can kind of vet their problem and issue and then we can go from there. And, and Dana, if you want to talk to Howie about some of the resources that you use or some of the things that you've done and get some feedback, uh, click on the raise hand button and I'll bring you up on stage. Um, I think that will be instructive for everybody. Um, just, I have a question for, for you, Howie, because we were talking, you know, you, the questions have to do with, uh, you know, what is your district doing um, based on the new act and what is your district doing to, you know, implement uh, the links between uh, beha student behavior and um, and academics. So, so if you're a, a teacher and your your school has these you know archaic programs where oh no you have to do three interventions before you can go to the, to a tier two and then you have to do um, three more interventions before you can go to a tier three and you're a teacher and you understand that those don't work what you know other than leaving the school but I mean what can you do? To, um, to be more effective with your students? Well, you know, I think there's power in numbers. And, I, and again, I, it's not that I'm suggesting a mutiny, but, you know, I think what you've got to do is you've got to look at are you getting the outcomes that you want from the time that is invested? And, you know, it makes no sense to delay the problem. I mean, one of the things that we talk about is that every time you do an intervention that does not work, you potentially make the student more resistant to the next intervention. And so we don't want to be doing or playing intervention roulette. We, want, we don't want to be doing random interventions. Doctors don't do random interventions. Car mechanics don't do random interventions. I mean, any profession that we know, they go through some kind of a diagnostic assessment process to figure out the underlying reason why you're having the difficulty and then linking it to the right approaches. And yet in education, um, it, it's like we've been doing educational malpractice. And so getting people together to look at the data, virtually every school in this country or district has to do a school improvement plan. It's supposed to be a database process. So look at the data that tell you whether or not your process is working. And then if the objective data are telling you it's not working or we're delaying the process, then we've got to come up with a new way to do it. So it's not about confronting people. It's about looking at are we having the impact that we want. The big issue in this country, and this is no disrespect, the vast majority of the schools I work with, even when I was in Arkansas working with schools in improvement status, I'm talking about schools that were priority and focus schools, schools mm -hmm. and staff do not go out of their way to be ineffective. They do what they know, right. and many times they don't know what they don't know. And that's why the value of these kind of discussions that we're having tonight is starting to hopefully enlighten people that there is another way and that just because the federal government says something, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's either right, mandated, or it's been vetted. Well, and I'd like to make a small suggestion, it, not that I'm getting paid for this, but it, it's, and it's, it is a little self-serving, is that maybe if you're listening to this and your principal you know, maybe you can go to your principal and say, you know, there's another session coming up on behavioral issues. You know, you probably would really enjoy it. And it's, you know, it's coming up on EdChat Interactive and suggest that, that the principal attend our, our next session. And, and maybe that would help. Uh, and, and, and I'll add so on. So let to me, that. let me, yeah. Yeah, I'll add on to that. And I'll, you know, and I do this all the time. Anyone who is on this session, I am happy to give you a free one hour conversation. We can do it either through Skype or just regular conference line, telephone or whatever. But again, I'd rather it be with your leadership team or your administrative team. 
and we can start talking about some of these issues. And so I, I do this all the time. I mean, I got to fit into my, into my schedule. But at the same time, what I'm all about is effective practice. This is not about paying the mortgage. This is about helping kids and staff. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I'll, I'll bring up the next set of slides then. Okay. All right, and and again, I'm gonna I'm gonna go through these fairly quickly. Um, I know that Mitch has posted the this quote handout, but if you can't find it, just email me, and um, I'll just I'll email it to you. It's no big deal. All right, so choice, not chance, determines one's destiny. So we don't want to do things by chance. We don't want to play intervention roulette. What we want to do is engage in a database functional assessment problem solving process. And here basically is the process, although I'm going to drill it a little bit uh, over the next, um, let's just say, 15 minutes. We have to identify the problem, figure out why it's happening, link the underlying reasons why it's happening to instructional or intervention approaches at some level of intensity, and then evaluate if it worked. Next slide. So breaking it down a little bit more, and now integrating some of the things that I've already talked about. We want to review the existing data. We've already talked about that. We want to identify where the student is right now versus where the student should be or needs to be. And that was in that review process that we already talked about, but we've got to identify the gap. We then want to use the scientific method and generate hypotheses as to why the gap is occurring. So why do we have the student being rude, crude, and obnoxious? So why is all this inappropriate behavior happening? Or conversely, or conjointly, why are we not getting enough or any of the appropriate behavior that we need? So we're generating hypotheses and then collecting data to confirm or reject the hypotheses. We don't assume that the hypotheses are right because we actually may be, quote, wrong. Next slide. So then we're linking the underlying reasons that have been confirmed with the interventions, but we have to design and write the intervention plan before implementation because a lot of times we got to make sure that we have the resources, we've done the training, we have the people at the table in the right seats on the bus where everybody's doing the right um, approaches to create a collaborative effort. We implement the intervention plan and then we formatively and summatively evaluate. So basically what I'm talking about is the scientific method applied to educational and social emotional behavioral problems, but that's not how we do it. A lot of times what we're doing is we have a kid with a social emotional behavioral problem. We send the student to, let's say, the school psychologist and understand I am one. I was past president of the National Association of School Psychologists. But what a lot of the assessments there are done is not to understand the problem, but to basically identify the problem and how serious it is. We've got to do a functional assessment. Next slide. But the functional assessment is not just of the student. It's of the instructional environment. And so we've got to do an assessment of the current and maybe past teacher instructional factors, curricular factors, as well as student factors. And I'm going to say this with tongue in cheek. I know that in our schools, we don't have any teachers who inadvertently reinforce inappropriate student behavior. And, and of course we do. And again, it inf it's not that they're going out of their way to be ineffective, but they may not understand what this student needs, how we need to adapt or modify, how to approach this student. And so the teacher may be actually making the problem worse. And the point is, if we don't assess the teacher instructional domain, we may not uncover the contributory factors to the student problem. And so this is not about blaming. It's about explaining, if I can use my Arkansas twang. Next slide. So just very quickly, examples. Some reasons why sometimes teachers are ineffective. And again, most teachers are effective with 85 to 90% of the kids. It's the 10% of the kids that they're just, they don't know what to do. So sometimes teachers are ineffective because they just simply don't have the knowledge of the professional development. Sometimes they have the knowledge, but they're not able to translate it and execute it from a skill perspective. Unfortunately, we have some teachers who say, I'm not working with those kids. Get that kid out of my classroom. I don't do, I don't do disability, which is crazy. 
sometimes we have teachers who are trying so many different things that they never allow something to take root and actually potentially become successful and so the underlying reason for their lack of success is inconsistency and then sometimes we have special situations sometimes teachers get too many of the wrong kind of kid in the classroom and we have a commingling effect and it's more about a group contagion than individual kids with individual needs. So again, you can see these are different areas of potential hypotheses to explain. Next slide. And again, you can read this, but all I did was take the effective teaching research. If you want to take Danielson, take Danielson. But in essence, what we want to do is we want to make sure on the front end that teachers are effective, but in the back end as we're evaluating if the teacher or the instruction is contributory to the student problem, here are the areas that we may need to look at. The planning, the climate, the presentation, relevant practice, all the way down to whether or not the teacher is progress monitoring and evaluating in, a, in an effective way. All right, next slide. On the curricular level, here are some of the high hit reasons why students have some of the problems with, with the curriculum or there are curricular gaps. Sometimes what we have are we've got expectations but we don't have a good alignment with the curriculum that is actually being instructed. Sometimes you have a curriculum, let's just say a social skills curriculum, and it's not a pedagogically or scientifically sound uh, curriculum. Sometimes we have a curriculum that is just not terribly relevant or engaging to the kids. Sometimes it's disorganized. Sometimes the curriculum needs to be modified, but there's no guidance in how to do the modification. And so the teacher's doing, if you will, the core curriculum and not doing the modifications that will make the curriculum successful with, again, the small number of students that are presenting with problems. So again, we've got to look at the curriculum and the efficacy, the depth and breadth of the curriculum because we may have a curricular casualty being the student as much as an instructional casualty being the instructional process. Or it may simply be the student. Next slide. And so some of the reasons where the, quote, problem is largely within the student. We may again have a student where there are biological, physiological issues that are contributing, maybe even causing the problem. We may have students that have skill deficits, students that have motivational or performance deficits. It may be that there is, again, inconsistency, and the student has a history of inconsistency, and that's the primary underlying reason. And then sometimes we have special situations. All right, so let's break this out. Um, very quickly with the next series of slides. So next slide. Here are the seven high hit reasons that when the student is largely, if you will, quote, responsible for the social, emotional, and behavioral issues that are being presented, here are the seven high hit reasons. And understand that some of your more complex kids, there may be more than one reason. High hit one, the student has a skill deficit. That is, you want the student to be able to work in a cooperative fashion. So there are certain social skills that represent cooperation. Um, there are social skills in terms of kids being able to listen, follow directions, ask for help, respond to teasing, um, accept consequences, and so on. And in high hit one, the student has not learned or has not been exposed to the social skill training. So it's a skill deficit. They simply haven't learned or mastered the skills. So, okay, obviously the intervention is going to be instruction. The second high hit, the student is learning the skills, but not as quickly as other students. So there is a, a slower speed of acquisition, and there's an increasing social, emotional, and behavioral gap, and that's the reason why the student, in essence, is popping up that the gap is so large in terms of their skill ability that um, they're, they're doing okay, but not for the chronic, chronological age level of the kids that they have. Second, uh, next slide. The third high hit is that the student can do it in certain settings, but not all settings. So they can do it in the classroom, but not in the common areas of the school. 
or they can do it in a small group situation, but not in a large group situation. So they have the skills, they are not applying or generalizing the skills across all of the setting circumstances um, and, and, and even staff that are uh, in the school or that the student is interacting with. High hit four, conditions of emotionality. This is a student who is able to do it when things are, quote, calm for them, but not when things are emotional. And, and again, you know, sometimes the emotionality, we don't see it. It's an internal level of emotionality like anxiety or a low self-concept. But the point is, is that the student does have the social, emotional, behavioral skills, but only under, under the conditions when they are, quote, calm. But then when things get emotionally revved up for them, then all of a sudden that's when they're presenting the problem. High hit five is motivational. The student has the skills, is choosing not to use the skills. So the first four high hits, skill deficit, speed of acquisition, transfer of training, conditions of emotionality, those are skill-based deficits. High hit five is a motivational deficit or a performance deficit. The student has the skill, they're choosing not to demonstrate the skill. Next slide. High hit six is inconsistency. In other words, what's happening is that there has been either inconsistent skill instruction or inconsistent motivation or accountability. And so what the student basically is doing is they are in the gap area. They're looking for loopholes. They um, are not sure when to demonstrate what skills under what conditions at what times. And so because their environment or the interactions within their environment have been inconsistent, we don't get this solid band of appropriate behavior. Next slide. And then the last high hit are what I call special situations. And those involve especially the common areas of the school, because in the common areas of the school, we have more kids, less adults, um, less physical boundaries, um, and a lot, sometimes a lot more um, agitation, chaos, movement, and so on. I mean, we're talking about the cafeteria, the hallway, the buses, the playground, um, um, and the common areas of the school. Another special situation is the teasing, taunting, bullying, harassment, hazing, and fighting. So when the peer group is involved, and so sometimes kids are demonstrating inappropriate behavior because of peer pressure. That's a special situation because you cannot solve that problem simply, simply by doing intervention with the individual student. You're going to have to also do intervention with the peer group. And then you've got other special situations that are more idiosyncratic to students, like, for example, uh, dysfunction at home or some kind of negative life crisis or life event or the fact that they're homeless or that they're living in poverty. So sometimes there are home or community-based issues. And again, obviously, they're the issues that are somehow contributing to the student's in-school problem, but you can't just simply solve it by doing an intervention solely on the student. So next slide. So in summary, where the problem, if you will, again, is largely coming from the student's domain, you have seven high hit reasons. Not that there aren't others, but in my experience as a school psychologist, these are the seven high hit reasons. And I very quickly gave you kind of a definition of term. Next slide. So now I'm giving you, in essence, a foreshadow or an advance organizer for our next session. So, and here's again the reinforcement that we need to understand the underlying reason for the problem in order to then know what intervention domain and approach we're going to take. So if we have a student with a skill deficit and they have not learned and mastered the, the social, emotional, and behavioral skill, obviously the intervention is we've got to teach the student the skill. The question is who, when, where, how, and under what level of intensity. If it's a speed of acquisition problem, then we may be able to do interventions that increase the learning rate of the student. That's, a, that's usually occurring through remediation, modification, or accommodation. Transfer of training. So the student is able to demonstrate the skill in one setting, but not all settings. We have to do interventions that focus on training for the transfer. Conditions of emotionality. We have to do interventions so that the student hopefully 
is doing things to prevent themselves from getting into emotional situations. But we also sometimes have to teach the students emotional control skills so that they're able, when they're in those conditions of emotionality, able to control their emotion so that their heads are clear so that they can execute their behavior. Obviously, high hit five, if it's a motivational problem, we need to, we need to implement some type of strategic or intensive motivational intervention. Inconsistency is a little bit tougher, it's more complex. We have to figure out where the inconsistency is, stop it. We may have to basically recalibrate the system relative to the student, so we have to deal with um, the aftermath of the inconsistency where the student might, again, be uncertain as to what to do, or from a motivational perspective, they're depending on the inconsistency in order to get away with things. So we basically have to, in, we have to eliminate the inconsistency, recalibrate the system, and then hopefully fade it all out so that the student is simply demonstrating the appropriate behavior. And then the special situations really do take a multidisciplinary, multifaceted approach, and it's really going to be more specific to what that special situation is. And so I can't give you some very quick rules of thumb on that. Last slide. This is where we're going next session. There are any number. I mean, there are 25, 30, 40, 50 different interventions um, collectively in these seven high hit areas that are available or could be available to a grade level teacher, a grade level team, um, a building level. The question is, are we matching up the underlying reason with the right intervention and do we have skilled people? Usually these are going to be our, 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 our student services folk. Do we have skilled people who can consult with our classroom teachers to facilitate the implementation of the right intervention? And so that's where we're going in our next session. Next slide. Um, tier three, uh, again, um, we'll, go, we'll go into that in the next session also. I thought I forgot the tier three slide. All right, next, next uh, slide. So there we are. Um, we, we covered a lot of ground, obviously, in a short period of time. This is just tip of the iceberg. If people are feeling overwhelmed, I understand. Um, the good news is you have a couple of different options. You can re-listen to this tape when Mitch posts it, but you can also go again to my website, and there are two or three um, webinars on their own that will expand on some of the discussions that we briefly had today. Plus, in our next session, that's when we're really going to be expanding on on, this, on the different types of interventions that, that, that right. people can make. Um, that was a lot of information. And, um, you know, even though I'm, I'm sorry that, that we kept people for a little bit longer than, than normal, but, um, wow, that, that was, uh, I learned an awful lot. So I just want to, want to thank you, Howie, for, for taking the time and, and sharing your knowledge with us. My pleasure. And um, so I'll, I'll, I'll see you in a couple weeks. And everybody else, I, I hope to see you in a couple weeks. And I hope to see you at some of the, the sessions that we're going to be having uh, next week and the week after also. So um, uh, and, uh, and from now on, you won't have to listen to any more uh, political debates either because those are now done. So uh, for Mrs. Mitch Weisberg, I'm signing off for EdChat Interactive. And uh, see you soon. Take care. Bye.